contribute to the cause. So thank you, Shannon, for being here. Um, before we get started, I wanna mention that today's program is made possible by the generosity of Senator Nancy Kassebaum. She asked that her 2016 Dual Leadership Prize be used in support of student programs. So thank you to her. We also wanna give a special thank you to Topper's Pizza who is donating free pizza coupons for a drawing at the end of our program. If you are a student and tuning in live today, be sure to type your name into the YouTube live chat function um, to be entered. If you can't say the whole time, no worries. Please refer back to this archived video on our YouTube channel and watch the end when we announce the winner. Good luck. Um, now let's welcome our guest, Shannon Walls. Shannon is a native of Kansas City, Missouri, but recently became a resident of the Lawrence community when she joined the staff of the Lawrence Humane Society as the executive director in January, 2020. At LHS, Shannon is focusing on building community-centric programs to help people and their pets in Lawrence and Douglas County. Prior to coming to LHS, Shannon spent eight years as the Director of Operations and Animal Behavior for Kansas City Pet Project, a nonprofit animal welfare organization operating the city of Kansas City's municipal animal shelter. Shannon was with the Kansas City Pet Project from its inception and helped to grow operations, expanding from a staff of 20 in 2012 to over 100 employees across three locations, increasing the scope, quality of services, and life-saving capacity provided to Kansas City's animals in need along the way. Shannon holds a Master of Science in Veterinary Medical Sciences from the University of Florida, where she studied veterinary forensics. Shannon is a proud adopter of two shelter pups, Tug and Finnegan Cooper, and she believes that ensuring they are happy and healthy is her most important work of all. So Shannon, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited that you can join us. Really excited to chat with you. Um, my dog, Sophie, you can see her paws. She's joining us. She's she's asleep, so maybe she'll she'll pop her head up later, but very excited that you're able to join us. Um, and you know, why don't you briefly start out by telling us a little bit more about yourself, maybe your upbringing, your education. Sure, thank you so much. Um, and um, Honored to be in the presence of your dog back there as well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, you know, when I was growing up uh, in Kansas City, um, very interested in, in theater and arts and things like that. Never expected that my life would sort of go down this road of um, getting involved with animals. And um, I went to uh, college at Missouri Western State University, and I actually got a degree in art to start out with. And um, I was working uh, my first job in volunteer management at the Girl Scouts, and I heard about some legislation that was being proposed where I lived um, at the time in Independence, Missouri, where they were looking to uh, ban pit bulls from living in the community. And at that time, I was not a pit bull owner, but I didn't think that it made good sense. And it kind of stoked this flame for me um, to start learning more about the issue. And I sort of stumbled into this other group of passionate pet owners who were concerned about this possible legislation. And we banded together and we started researching and uh, presenting at city council meetings. And um, that really was the catalyst for me to start thinking about another life for myself. Um, and I also had this sort of side interest in dog training. And uh, about seven years into my career at Girl Scouts, I had an opportunity to take a severance um, and start a, a new career path. And I went to dog training school. And it was at that point that I kind of committed myself to my, my new passion, which was all things animals. And, um, and that led me into a career in animal sheltering. Uh, had a few friends of mine call me and say, hey, I think we might be crazy, but we want to bid on the contract to run the city shelter in Kansas City. And I was like, yeah, that sounds crazy, but if you're <laughs> in, I'm in. And um, I went from never wanting to set foot inside an animal shelter to being the last one out at midnight every night, locking up the facility, you know, eat, sleep, drink, breathe, shelter. And, you know, that's how I've ended up where I am today. <laughs> awesome. What a great story. Awesome. Um, so, you know, what is kind of the day-to-day -day work at the Lawrence Humane Society like? Uh, you know, we kind of have two facets of the operation. You know, one is how are we caring for the animals? And, um, you know, caring for the animals is more than just food, water, shelter. It's always lo looking at things like enrichment, human interaction, 
socialization, um, all those kinds of components. So we have that side of the operation. And then there is the more public facing side, which is where we provide services to the community um, and we facilitate uh, making love matches between uh, adopters and pets that we have available. Our community services are gonna be things like uh, taking in animals that don't have other options through our intake program. It's also gonna be uh, our foster program where we have folks who are temporarily caring for animals until they're available for adoption. And then we're also doing services like low cost public spay neuter, trap neuter and release for community cats so that we can keep uh, these colonies of cats from, from growing exponentially. And then finally, one of our newer programs, which is uh, providing resources to help keep pets and people together, um, especially through hardship. Uh, if we can give them a resource to help them keep their pet rather than intaking their animal, that's really kind of where we want to be. How did that work? How does the work that you're doing now kind of differ from what you're doing at the KC Pet Project? So a lot of what we're doing is really a national trend, I would say. And so I think you you would hear, you know, both from, from KC Pet Project's executive director and myself, um, that the emphasis really shifting on community services. One of the really beautiful things that happened um, in this horrible pandemic we call COVID uh, is that nationally animal welfare organizations all started talking to each other, sharing resources, um, you know, talking about successes and failures, not reinventing the wheel. If something was working for someone, could somebody else borrow it? And um, so I think we're all really focused on, you know, how we can take this antiquated model of sheltering and revise it in a way that is really better meeting the needs of the community. You know, the shelter can't be the sole protector of all animals. This really has to be a community issue. And sometimes it isn't best for the animal to enter our facility. And that's really a new concept that we never really talked about before. And um, it's, it's really, we're on the cusp of huge change within our industry. Awesome, I think Sophie appreciates that. So she, she popped her head up, hopefully she'll go back to sleep here in a minute. <laughs> that's um, gotta give so, some security for dogs that they're, exactly. that we're gonna help them stay with their owners. She appreciates that. She can't, she can't leave me. No. Um, <laughs> can you speak to, to the animal welfare progress that is being made on a local, state, national, and perhaps even international level too? Yeah, so I think we're all kind of grappling with, you know, how we can reallocate our resources in a way that is better addressing the issues that are happening uh, in, in, in communities. And so, you know, there's this cycle of what, you know, we just take animals in and we find them new homes and, and we, you know, and there are always going to be animals that need us to do that. And I am grateful that we can be a safety net for them, but it doesn't really get us out of the sort of rat race of this, you know, and so we have to start looking at the reasons why animals would be surrendered to an animal shelter. And are there better ways that we can address those before they enter the shelter doors? And, and like I said before, that's a really a national discussion, but it's also a pretty huge important priority for us locally in the Lawrence community. One of the really beautiful things that's happened for us, again, in spite of COVID, um, is that we were able to get funding from Douglas County to provide services to the community to help with pet retention and to have a county want to fund that. That's groundbreaking. Like, I'm really proud of this community that they would fund that. And I don't think that's necessarily happening across the board. People are looking a lot to private funding, which we also need to do. I mean, we have to be able to sustain our program, but Douglas County really gave us um, seed money to prove that helping people keep their pets was, was the future of how we can serve this community best. And so um, we're, we launched a program uh, October 13th called the Crisis Pet Retention Fund. Um, and that was specifically geared for this purpose of saying, you know, yeah, you may have hardship, but that doesn't mean this pet needs a new home or that you need to give it up. Um, there are really strong ties to mental health and the human animal bond. And so being able to talk about that more is really changing what people are interested in funding and, and you know, what our expectations are for an animal welfare organization in our community. Absolutely. 
Can you speak to Senator Dole's legacy on animal welfare a little bit? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about animals is that, you know, there's these certain categories, you know, you've got animals that are used for food, and you've got animals that are used for research, and you've got pet animals, and each group or class of animals has a different level of protection. Um, you know, what, what, is considered suffering for a pet animal is very different than what it would be for an, an animal um, going to slaughter or an animal in pet research. And so, you know, looking at the legacy of Senator Dole, he really tried to establish a baseline of what's considered humane um, for two classes in particular, research and slaughter uh, of animals that were that basically really didn't have their interests represented. And so I think um, the legacy is really that, you know, we now have this like minimum expectation of what these animals, um, what we can expect for these animals in the way that they're treated that just didn't exist before. And I think it has certainly elevated um, the idea of humane treatment of animals across the board. Absolutely. Do you have, um, or actually, so what are your organization's top priorities in animal welfare right now and also in the sort of immediate future? Yeah, so um, obviously we're always looking at how we can provide the best possible care for animals while they're in our facility. And so we are look, looking to strengthen programs that we have in place, like providing daily enrichment. Um, we really think that dogs getting out to play every day and cats having access to interactive items in their kennels are really important. And, you know, we're, we're working hard to build our programs to make sure that we can have those levels of care for animals beyond just the basics. Um, so we have to look internally and make sure that we are a good example of, you know, how to treat animals at a core level. Beyond that, we're really, really wanting to build more and more of our community partnerships so that our crisis pet retention fund um, and some other programs that we have you know, envisioned for the future will really take off. Um, by helping people when they're in crisis, um, mm -hmm. we're preventing them from surrendering their pet to the shelter. And you know, we're also, I think, strengthening you know, our presence in the community uh, in a way that is non-judgmental and really promoting what is safest and health healthiest for our people population. I don't think we used to talk about people so much. You know, they were like, you know, you surrender, or you don't, you're good or you're bad. And, and it's just not that simple anymore, especially as we start to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have to start thinking about the way that animal welfare and people you know, intersect and they're, they just can't be separated out anymore if we're taking an honest look at this discussion. Um, so we wanna to continue to fund our crisis pet retention fund. Um, we're going to need support from the community in terms of private donations uh, to continue to do that. But just since we launched our program in October, we have helped over 300 families um, be able to receive medical care, receive uh, boarding assistance so that they can have somewhere to put their pet that's safe while they secure housing if they've lost their housing. Um, just preventative veterinary care to keep their pets healthy. Um, you know, a variety of different ways that we've tried to help. It's so critical to us to continue to do that. And that really is kind of the future of what we wanna accomplish. Um, we also really wanna look at housing issues. So um, again, when we talk about pets and people and their, their needs kind of intersecting, um, we have to start looking at the inequities in housing and how that connects to people's ability to maintain a, a pet or, or to even move into a, a housing complex or a community um, because of the pet that they choose to keep. And those are really important issues to us. So we want to do everything that we can to influence um, friendly housing policies regarding pets. Absolutely. That's something I had never even thought that would correlate to, to you know, adopting or uh, anything like that. So that's a really interesting point. Um, is there any current legislation that you're aware of that is progressing or maybe regressing the fight for animal welfare? You know, that's a really good question. Um, right now, a lot of what the battles are kind of more at a local level, uh, you know, in terms 
you know, the ones that are on my radar, radar, I should say, um, you know, because obviously we have a pretty strong focus on, um, you know, pets per se versus some of the other types of animal legislation. I know there's some stuff going on with um, uh, dog racing, greyhound racing and things like that. Um, but as far as, you know, animal welfare through the scope of pets, you know, it's really looking at local ordinances and making sure that they are not, you know, excluding people from being able to live in those communities because of things like breed restrictions or um, if they, they have really strict policies on the number of pets that you can own and things like that, that um, don't actually address the problems that they think they do. They are actually just like, whether people realize it or not, they're just tools for keeping groups of people out of communities. And so um, some communities are more progressive than others. Um, one of the nice things about the Lawrence community is that, you know, they did an overhaul of their um, local animal ordinances a couple years back, and they are, you know, among the more progressive in the country. And I'm really glad that I get to work in a community that is that way. Awesome. Awesome. How important is social media in kind of combating um, animal cruelty? Wow. I, I think uh, it's allowed people to really spread the word about things that are happening, you know, before it's kind of a he said, she said, and, and whether we're talking about animals or, you know, injustices against humans, people are quick to pull out their phone and capture video. And then, you know, now we can start to have more conversations about what's happening and we can try to get better justice for these animals. So I think, you know, social media and just access to phones, so, or sorry, cameras so easily through our phones are um, really changing what goes uh, seen versus unseen and opens up a dialogue for us to really address some of what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I also, I want to, you know, invite our, our viewers watching today to start thinking of some questions. I have a few more, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying learning from you. And so I want to, you know, also just invite our viewers to, to start thinking of some and feel free to, to share them in the YouTube live chat too, so we can, we can get to those. Um, do you have any prominent stories of, you know, special, special shelter pets that you've encountered over the years that, that you'd like to share? Oh, I, um, gosh, there's many, but I'll tell you one about a, a dog here that we have worked with at the Lawrence Humane Society. So one of the challenges that we always have with pets is, you know, assessing them in the shelter. And we have a certain responsibility to the community to make sure that we're trying to you know, place animals safely. And so, um, you know, when we look at their behavior in the shelter, sometimes animals can be behaviorally suppressed and sometimes they can be, you know, more, more um, intense than they might be out in the real world. And so we try to figure out how to help these animals in less than ideal conditions when we're assessing them. And, you know, we made the decision to advocate for a dog here at the shelter that we call Diesel. And he, you know, certainly was struggling with long-term confinement at the shelter. And so, you know, we did things like make him our, our office dog and, you know, try to take a special interest in his emotional health so that his behavior would improve. Um, ultimately, we moved him into foster care, which I think is such a critical program uh, for shelters. Like how a dog behaves in the shelter and how they behave in the home are two different things. And and foster homes are, are able to help us really see who this pet truly is. And so he did get that opportunity, which was, I think, a gateway for him to move on towards adoption. And um, he, he's kind of a poster child for, for 2020 in terms of how our advocacy can be life-changing. You know, for us, when he was at the shelter, he really wasn't that great with other dogs. And, um, you know, through all this extra uh, investment in his emotional health, he moved on to get an adopter who like takes him, uh, he wears a little life jacket and he goes out boating with her and he swims and, you know, now he actually can be around other dogs. And, and so those are things that we wouldn't have seen from him if we didn't go the extra mile. And I think that's, you know, really what a good shelter program, you know, should be trying to do. Awesome. Uh, what can our viewers uh, joining us today, how can 
how can they contribute to the animal welfare cause? What are your kind of tidbits that that you would encourage um, our viewers to to kind of you know immerse themselves in? Yeah, I mean, I think there are multiple prongs that someone can go down and they have to kind of look at what works for them. You know, obviously volunteering at a shelter, you know, we couldn't do half of what we do if we didn't have volunteers, you know, especially fosters right now for us are just our lifeline, um, you know, donating. And even if you're not someone who has a lot to give, it doesn't mean that your contribution doesn't make a difference. We can do a lot with a small amount of money. Um, and also sometimes you guys can can expand your power by, uh, you know, creating uh, fundraisers on in your social network and things like that. They can, you know, e extrapolate how much money you can raise. Um, but also I think just being interested in what's going on in your community and active in, you know, local politics can have a real significant impact. You know, I can say all day long what I think about, you know, the way things should happen in, within the city or what our laws should be, but, it, it has to come from a, a larger voice in order for that to really take shape. And so the way that we advocate in our community has a strong influence on the kind of legislation that we have. Um, and, and also, you know, just where our dollars go and, and what our community is passionate about. So, you know, don't wait for someone else to, to speak up, like do your part and, and as a collective, you guys can make a difference. Sure. Yeah, that's great advice. I have I have a few more questions for you. So again, um, inviting our viewers tuning in today to to share some questions with us. Um, so in your bio, you mentioned you have uh, two pups at home, Tug and Finnegan Cooper. How do they, uh, you know, just kind of contribute to to the work that you do? And and you know, what what do they mean to you? How important is are them to you know to what you do at at Lawrence Wayne Society? You know, I think they, they serve on a, a couple of different levels. I mean, obviously they represent who I'm working for. And so that emotional connection and the human animal bond remind me every day of how important the work is that we do and how meaningful it is on a personal level. Um, I also think they provide emotional support for me, you know, up until, you know, about a month ago, I actually had a dog I brought to work with me every day. She passed away um, from kidney failure, but uh, she, for all intensive purposes, was my de facto um, emotional support dog. And, you know, frankly, I think every executive director <laughs> could use an emotional support dog. Um, but they're just that tangible reminder of the work that I do, and they fill me back up. So I'm equipped to do it again every day um, because I have that, that benefit of the bond that we share. Are there certain congressmen and uh, women who have strong animal welfare platforms that kind of speak out to you? Hmm. Not off the top of my head. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of, of, of what we've been focusing on lately has really been um, looking at things at a local level for us and focusing on the local community. There isn't anything like super big on the horizon that I know of yet um, that, you know, is on my radar, but I, I certainly would not profess to be, you know, the absolute expert on that. Sure. Um, I do want to ask you, so what is your like absolute favorite part about your work that you do at LHS? I know there has to be so many things, but what is, if you had to narrow it down to, to one thing, what's, what's the one thing that, you know, you know, gets you up in the morning that, that you're so excited to do right when you, right when you go into work? I think it is this intersection of pets and people that it excites me the most. So that's why like our, our work that we've been doing this year on serving the community directly uh, has been so exciting. You know, I can love on a pet and I can do things to make things better for that animal. But when I change a person and it better equip them to carry on the work, I think that's when, you know, I feel like I'm making the biggest impact that I can. And, you know, I can tell you a few stories about some of these people that we've been helping in the community. Um, and I kind of, I feel like so lucky that I get to be the person that says, or that my staff gets to be the people that say yes um, to helping someone who thinks that they have no other solution. You know, having owned a dog who's been suffering from a chronic illness for the last two years and the way that I worry over her and I worry about whether or not I have the finances to help her, 
And I think about what it must be like for someone to have to give up their pet and how blessed I am that I've managed to get by by the skin of my teeth, you know, doing everything for her that she needed to keep her going. Um, you know, not everybody can do that. And so if I can help someone not have to make that gut wrenching decision, or if I can help someone over the hump who I know, you know, generally speaking, takes good care of their pet, but they're experiencing hardship like that. That's when I get goosebumps and tears in my eyes at the same time. And, um, and I just love that kind of work. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's definitely incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, I do have a, we have a question in from one of our viewers. So Angie E asks, are you still looking for volunteers to walk the dogs regularly? What other volunteer opportunities are there at the Lawrence Humane Society? Uh, thank you for that question. So we kind of took a hiatus for a while because of COVID um, and we really severely limited the number of people that were inside the building. And so we um, stopped having volunteers altogether for a while. And then we've kind of opened up the gates a little bit. It's still somewhat restricted, but we have open shifts that are available if someone feels comfortable. You know, we don't, we don't want to have a flood of volunteers walking around with us not being able to maintain social distancing. So we have shifts that are available um, and we've restricted the number of slots so that we know that everyone can perform those tasks safely. And so we are taking new volunteers. We just started last week um, and there is a way for you guys to get orientation online. Initially, when you first start out, we have you helping with some of the like workroom tasks, which are you know, dishwashing and laundry and things like that. And then pretty quickly you can earn hours towards uh, being able to have direct contact with the animals if that's of interest to you as well. Um, I am in desperate need of some help with some of our groundskeeping as well, just keeping our brand new facility that we moved into a year and a half ago beautiful. So I would definitely encourage someone who's thinking about wanting to start volunteering with us that, that to go ahead and pursue that because we, we do need your help. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I also, I just got a chat. So I think our viewers there are being a little shy. So if you guys want to win a free pizza coupon drawing, be sure to, you know, type your name in the YouTube chat. Um, and also be sure to send in some questions. Shannon has a wealth of knowledge and we would love to, to hear from you guys. We do have another question. So Catherine asks, what is the limit of slots for pets at the Lawrence Humane Society right now? And have you had any issues with kind of um, limits on capacity. Like how many animals can we care for in our facility? Yes. So Catherine, I'm pretty sure that's what you're asking, right? <laughs> that's what I'm going to answer. Yeah. <laughs> she can respond. Okay. To yeah. She says yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, so ideal capacity for us is 75 animals, uh, 75 dogs and 145 cats. Um, our kennels are pretty spacious. And so there is some potential, like if we had uh, a crisis, um, you know, maybe there was some kind of uh, unexpected hoarding case or something where those kennels sizes can be reduced to increase our capacity, but that's not our goal. We don't like to do that if we can avoid it, uh, just because the more space we can give our animals, the the um, happier and healthier they are. And so that would be more of like in a temporary worst case scenario versus, you know, what, what our day-to-day -day operations are. We do tend to run pretty close to capacity most of the time. And the reason is because we want to help as many animals as we can. So in addition to taking in animals from the Lawrence community, uh, we also transfer in animals from other rescues and shelters uh, that have less prospects for placement in their community. Um, like, for example, a rural shelter, uh, you know, maybe doesn't have uh, as high of a demand. And so those animals are sitting in their shelter, not moving, or they're at risk for euthanasia. Then we look at what available space we have, and we try to transfer in animals to give them an opportunity at adoption. Awesome. So while we're kind of waiting for some more questions to, to roll in, I did I did some research and I looked up some some fun facts about Senator Dole and, and his kind of commitment to animal welfare. And I just thought I'd share them too. Um, so in 2016, Senator Dole won the ASPCA Humane Award. It's funny because it's there's a little bit of a correlation between you and Senator Dole. You guys both bring in your pets to work. So um, during his time in Congress, he brought in um, his miniature schnauzer 
leader one. Leader one was always at his side. Um, and, you know, of course, like you mentioned, Senator Dole championed humane legislation and, and brought attention to important animal issues. Um, and he's continued to remain active um, since his retirement from politics in 2013. Um, this, this next little fact is kind of crazy. So they have a long line of dogs and a few of them um, have been shelter, shelter pups in the mix, but it's funny. So his first dog, Leader One, was adopted from a humane society um, and was actually a gift from Senator Elizabeth Dole, his wife, when Bob Dole assumed majority leadership in the Senate in 1984 or 85, I think. So that's funny. And Leader One was the one that he would always bring into work. So it's also funny because Leader One is the grandfather of Leader Two. He was born in 1999. And Leader Two, this is where it gets complicated, is the father of Blazer, who's born in 2010. And then Walter, who was born in 2018, is the son of Blazer. So he's the fifth generation from Leader One. So there's a lot of a lot of connections there. Their, their three current dogs are Walter, Blazer, and Leader Three. So um, lots of lots of pups in the mix there. So good to know that, that there have been some from Humane Society adoptions too. We have another question that came in and Kate Kay asks, is there a way for me to volunteer virtually? I'm not currently in Lawrence, but she's curious if she can help out any way she can from, from her hometown. Uh, I would actually love that. I've got a few things I could have you work on. We don't specifically have a program set up for virtual uh, volunteers. However, I will, I have some jobs at, on my mind. So I would say, if you want to reach out to me directly, um, I can put you to work. Um, and you guys can contact me at my email. It's uh, swells at lawrencehumane.org. And I would love to have some extra help. Perfect. Um, I will be sure to share that with, um, with our guests or yes. with our viewers today. Um, we're still waiting on some, on some questions to come in. You know, I just want to remind people to, to share some and that we will, and also, you know, include your name in the YouTube live chat for, to be entered into the drawing for the free pizza coupon. Um, we are also doing a social media contest this week and early next week. So feel free to send in a picture of you and your pet. Um, and you can tag or tag Dole SAB and we will, uh, you know, include you in a drawing for another pizza coupon. So very exciting. Hey, um, Abby, um, if you don't yeah. mind, I'd love to tell a couple stories about some of the families that we have helped with our crisis pet retention fund. Cause I think it really is going to be a little more tangible understanding of our program, um, and kind of the direction of what we're trying to do for our community locally, if that's Absolutely. okay. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask what other stories you had to share, anything else that you wanted our viewers to know. So go right ahead. Of course. So obviously our program's called the Crisis Pet Retention Fund. And so, you know, it, as it says in the name, it's really geared towards, you know, trying to help pets be able to keep, or people be able to keep their pets. Um, you know, we've been so blessed to be able to, to help uh, families that are just genuinely love their animals and, um, you know, just have the most unimaginable hardship, you know, that, it, that we feel for. And, um, it's been really exciting to be able to be there for them. Um, we, one of our very first people that we helped early on in October, uh, was a mother and her son who showed up at the shelter unannounced, uh, to surrender. They had both lost their home. Um, they did not have housing because of COVID. Uh, I mean, they did not have jobs. And so um, they were actively working for a way to fix their situation. And um, they couldn't even go to job interviews because they had nowhere to put their pet. And so, you know, we said, well, hold on, you know, we think we can help you. And um, we were able to put that, bed in, that pet into boarding um, so that we could reunite them once their situation was stable. And, you know, that can take a little time. It can take a month or two, um, maybe three months. And so we can see how someone would think that they need to surrender a pet and to be able to look at this animal who is deeply loved and well cared for and say, you know, we don't need to find this dog a new home. 
Like it has someone who really cares for it, obviously, because they were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. So, so like, what if we just help you over this hump? And so, um, he, this dog went into boarding for a couple weeks and then we were able to secure a foster home for him. And, you know, he's, he's tucked in safe and he's loved and his family checks in and, and they're doing everything that they can to get themselves in a better situation to take him back. And I think this is a, a great example of how, you know, we have people that are already doing everything that they can, but circumstances, you know, affect their ability to keep what is, for all intensive purposes, a family member. Um, but I don't think that finding that dog a new home is the best situation. You know, it's not the best solution for that dog. Absolutely. Sometimes we're not so lucky. And despite our efforts, you know, they still end up uh, resulting in the pet being surrendered. But I think there is beauty in that as well in the way that we can serve people. You know, we had a woman who um, surrendered her pet to us, or sorry, she enrolled it in the crisis pet retention fund program um, for us to board the animal. And we put the dog into foster care and, you know, she had some personal issues that she needed to sort out and, um, you know, was unwilling to get the treatment that she needed until she knew that her pet was in a safe place. And we were able to do that for her. Um, and eventually she did decide that it was in the best interest to surrender the animal, but we were able to create a safe space around that decision um, and allow her an opportunity to do that, not as a knee jerk response to a crisis, but um, in thoughtful consideration about her situation and her needs and the ability for her to make that decision, I have to believe was made easier by knowing that the dog already had a safe community surrounding it that was going to make sure that it, that it was well cared for. And even though the pet ultimately was not retained for that home, I think this is a win because it, it became the best way that we could resolve this situation for this pet owner um, and honor their, their ability to make that kind of decision. So those are the kinds of things that we want to be able to do for people that the system hasn't allowed us to do in the past, but that, you know, we're, we're now finding, you know, we can do this and, and, um, you know, we can preserve these bonds. And I think that ultimately makes for a happier, healthier community and a better use of our resources. I think we're always going to need to bring animals into the shelter, but I want to find homes for the ones that really don't have any other options. You know, I don't want to, you know, just do it because that's the most convenient answer for the problem in front of us at the moment. Absolutely. Those are some great stories. So thank you so much for, for sharing those. We had a few more questions roll in. Um, Anna B asks, are there any donations that can be made to the shelter such as toys or food? Yeah. We and how do you recommend going about doing doing that. Yeah, we rely on donations heavily, um, food, toys, you know, monetary donations. Um, sometimes people bring us bedding and things like that. And those are all very useful to us. You know, if you're local to Lawrence, um, we, you know, with COVID, we don't have the public fully into the building. Um, so we've set up donation tables at both of our entrances. So if you have something that you want to bring, you can, you can leave it on the donation table. If you need a donation receipt, you can ring the doorbell. We're happy to do that for you. Um, we also have uh, a couple of Amazon wish lists, so you can pick out items that you would like to purchase, and those can be directly shipped to us. Um, you can also make monetary donations online. You can stop by the shelter. Uh, you can start a fundraiser on Facebook for us. Um, there are so many different ways that you guys can can make a difference. And you know, if there's a program that we offer that is of particular interest to you and you want to give monetary donations, you can direct it in the way that is most meaningful to you, um, you know, whether that's, you know, going to the day-to-day -day care of the animals, or if you're passionate about community cats and you want to support our TNVR program, you can do that. The crisis pet retention fund, we've got, we've got the ability for you to direct those monies where, wherever um, you are most passionate. Awesome. We have another question. So Catherine asks, are there any especially exotic stories you have about animals um, that that you've experienced maybe at your time in at LHS or even at the Casey Pet Project too that, you, that you'd like to share? Well, yeah, we have certainly seen our fair share. Since I've been here at LHS uh, for 
uh, what is it now? I'm entering my 12th month. Um, we've, you know, we get farm animals, uh, small farm animals. Um, we did have a pig come in this year that was uh, a little feisty that we had to, you know, you, you got to neuter those male pigs or they, they get, a, they get unruly. Um, but I have dealt with more extreme exotic situations. Uh, when I worked in Kansas City, uh, we've had a couple alligators that come in. Um, and then we've, we've had to uh, route those to appropriate places that can provide long-term care, um, you know, some wildlife, you know, fortunately in a lot of these communities, there are alternative agencies that are better equipped to handle those things. You know, wildlife is its own specialty, but we'll have had these animals pass through our care temporarily. Um, you know, uh, we had uh, at LHS this year, a gentleman who came by with a stray kitten and when we I went to go receive the kitten. It was actually a baby bobcat. It was so cute. Um, <laughs> but we, we do have these brushes with exotics uh, or wild animals um, that are, you know, kind of cool, I would say. Al alligators, that's intense. I, whew. Yeah, that, that one went to a, a special sanctuary. <laughs> yeah. But we had to care for it for, it was, you know, kind of still technically a baby, but it was with its tail and everything. It was probably a good six feet long and uh, you know, we had to wrangle it every day to keep it clean. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we have, we have another question. Um, Angie asks, so what kind of resources, obviously you talked about, you know, your crisis prevention program um, yep. is I believe. And so are, besides that, what other res resources are out there for people who love and care for their animals, but are struggling to maybe financially support them? Uh, beyond LHS or, um, you know, within the scope of what we do, I'll start with what we do. Yeah. And then anywhere from there. Um, so for the Lawrence Humane Society, like a lot of things are encompassed by our, um, our crisis pet retention fund, but we also do generally offer low cost spay neuter services to the public. Um, and so those are going to be at a reduced rate great and you can also get low cost vaccines um, as well. Uh, under, th under the crisis pet retention program, we are doing things like uh, helping with food, helping with flea and tick prevention, helping with um, vaccines, spay neuter, uh, you know, the gamut. And then we've had some folks who have, you know, had an emergency situation with their pet. And normally they may be able to afford it, but because of reduced hours or lost job, they, they don't have that excess uh, money to perform, uh, you know, an emergency surgery or what have you. So we've been able to provide some help in those areas as well. And like I said before, boarding, we also have assisted with pet rent and pet deposits um, for folks so that they can keep their pet, whether they're moving into a new place or they have a, a monthly commitment. You know, what we can do is, is really uh, driven by the resources that we have. And so that's going to ebb and flow, but we try to do what we can to say yes to the people who need us the most. Um, beyond that, you know, locally in Lawrence, um, I can't put my finger on any other specific resources other than uh, the Trinity Pet Pantry, who does a weekly pet food drive. And they are a huge asset to this community. Um, they oftentimes have extra things like pet, like winter coats for dogs and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and sometimes they, you know, get a donation of flea and tick product and things like that. So they are, um, you know, boots on the ground, really serving people that just need the basics. And so that's also available out there as well. Um, and if someone needs food and shows up at our door, we're going to give them food uh, as well. So they've got a couple of options there. Um, you know, there are certainly other organizations, you know, nationally that can sometimes provide support to people, but I can't speak to specifically to what their requirements are. Awesome. It's funny that you, that you mentioned the winter coats for dogs. We have one for Sophie and she gets so angry when, when we try and put it on her. So I, I now know, know. They hate it. Yeah, exactly. I now know to not even, not even bother. They have yeah. all the fur for a reason. So, yeah. um, those are all the questions that we have. Um, and, you know, I want to welcome you to share any closing comments, you know, about your work, about LHS that, that you'd, you'd like to share, and then, and then we'll close out. 
Well, I just want to thank everybody for their interest in animal related issues, especially in the local Lawrence community, um, you know, and beyond as well. We are uh, so blessed to work in a community where people genuinely care about animals and it allows us to be a good example, a good role model uh, to other communities because of the things that we're able to accomplish here. We can, we can sort of uh, uh, be a, a demonstration of uh, how these kinds of programs can actually work. And so if people are passionate about any of the things that we've discussed, I would certainly love to have them connect with our organization because we're, we're only able to do more with, you know, more support, whether that's, you know, hands, boots on the ground, or if it's, you know, contributions, but um, we're pretty committed to moving in the direction of more community centric opportunities. Um, and we would love to have people that want to share that passion with us. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. You know, before I have some closing remarks, I want to say that our winners of the pizza coupon contest, we have three winners today, Anna Bollinger, Catherine Magania, and Kate Kemper. So we also will be in touch with the three of you to be sure to, to get the, those coupons mailed off to you. So thank you so much for, for your support and, and tuning in today. And we also have coupons that we will be giving out on our social media contest. So again, feel free to follow the Dole SAB's Instagram account. There's some more information um, on there and we'll be giving out more coupons for that social media contest. Um, Miss Wells, thank you so much for joining us today. I had so much fun. I learned a lot. Love talking about animals and I think Sophie enjoyed, enjoyed learning too. So really appreciate it. Um, you know, I want to thank all of our viewers today who, who tuned in and all of our viewers throughout the, throughout the semester. I had such a great time this semester. And if this was the first program you were able to join us, um, then welcome. We're so thankful that you're here and, you know, feel free to, to check our, uh, the Dole Institute's YouTube live channel. We have so many programs, PMPs, discussion groups, Fort Leavenworth series, all of our afternoon and evening programs. So feel free to, to tune in to those over the holiday season and students watching today. Good luck on finals. Have a great winter break. And again, Ms. Wells, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.